Hello biology students. Today we're going to be talking about the domain bacteria and archaebacteria, both of which are prokaryotes. Let's get started. So um, our domain and kingdom for archaebacteria has the following characteristics. It's unicellular, single-celled. They're prokaryotes. Remember, they don't have uh, nuclei. They have a cell wall, but it doesn't have this molecule in it. All right, you don't have to have that memorized. They're prokaryotes, like I mentioned. They are motile or they're non-motile, meaning they can be moving around. Some of them don't. Some of them are autotrophs, making their own food. Some of them are heterotrophs. They have to feed on other things. And they're thought to be the oldest first organisms on the planet. They're adapted for extreme environments. For instance, and you really only need one or two of these examples, they can live in very, very salty areas or hot volcanoes or areas of no oxygen. So sometimes in calling, instead of calling them bacteria, we call them eubacteria because we think of these as our more common true bacteria. And this phrase eu means true, the true bacteria. And so remember that specific um, kingdom, it's also unicellular. It does have that weird extra molecule in the cell wall. So they both had cell walls, but this one has that molecule embedded. They're also prokaryotes. They can be autotrophs like blue-green algae, but they could be heterotrophs. Most of them are modal and they'd use flagella or they'd spin around to move. But there's also some that are non-modal that do not move. All right, so almost all of the characteristics are the same. These ones are more common, they're less extreme, and they have slightly different cell walls. So let's look at some bacterial shapes. You do need to know these terms. There's some that are round, which we spell like this. All right, and we see it in the scientific name for strep bacteria, streptococcus or cocci which means round. You could draw an example of round bacteria. They're more circular shaped and they kind of go next to one another. Remember they're single celled and this is a colony of them. There's also some that are called bacillus which look like rods. Again, they're each a different organism but they connect to form a colony. This is E. coli which we sometimes hear about in the news. And lastly, there's spirilla, which look like spirals or little pieces of pasta that are kind of spirally shaped. And again, each individual spiral is an individual organism. So we don't see these embedded into the names of the organisms. So a lot of times that can help us know what it's going to look like a little bit. Let's talk about the reproduction. There's two major types. They, though, can divide and make new bacteria really fast. And that part's really important, and we oftentimes utilize that for genetic engineering, which we've talked about previously. The first type of reproduction is asexual type, and it's called binary fission. It is when the cell will divide in half, producing two identical daughter cells. We know when they're genetically identical, we can call them clones. This looks like almost like mitosis, but we don't call it mitosis because mitosis, that term refers to something going on in the nucleus. And do bacteria have a nucleus? No. So we call it a different name, but it's almost the same exact idea as mitosis. There's also a sexual reproduction option called conjugation. This is when the different bacteria cells will exchange genetic information by, with one another, one another by sending out a cool bridge. That bridge is called pili. Remember that sexual reproduction is related to ability to have genetic diversity versus all of the organisms being genetically the same are clones. So again, this is how they would send out this cool bridge called a pili, and that's what they'd send and exchange some DNA through that so that they become more genetically diverse. Well, why do we care so much about bacteria? Well, they're pretty important for our society and for the world. So they're decomposers, remember? 
that's a heterotroph example, and they break down organic compounds, and we need them to recycle those nutrients. We use that fact, and we use bacteria to do that in our wastewater treatment plants, breaking down our poop and stuff so that we can recycle our water. We also use them to make sure that nitrogen becomes available to every organism on the planet through the pro process of nitrogen fixation. Bacteria can convert nitrogen into a usable form to make proteins. They're often found on these weird little growths on legumes, which is one of the reasons why legumes are great, um, great plants to be growing as a farmer. They're also frequently found in our food products. For instance, bacteria are really important for fermentation processes. We oftentimes will use them to um, produce energy, produce lactic acid, and we use those in making food. For instance, sometimes bacteria will be in the process of making yogurt, pickles, sour cream, kimchi. All of those things are things that people eat, and so they're pretty important to making those food items. Pretty neat. But there's also some bacteria that we normally would talk about getting a bad rap, or that those are the ones that are really causing our diseases and making people sick. Those are the type that actually are damaging cells. And there's plenty of good bacteria in our tummies and in those food products, but there are types that are damaging and not so good. And they do this because they're damaging the host tissue. An example is the TB bacteria, and they're really damaging the cell because they're heterotrophs and they're using that host cell as food. All right. Another problem is some bacteria not only damage the cells, but they'll release toxins or poisons as they're moving through the host and they're traveling through that host body and disrupting normal activities. This would be our strep throat bacteria, right? Not only does it make us feel sick because it's damaging our cells, but it also releases some toxins which give us our fever and make us not feel good. Lots of different examples. You do not need to write them all down, but I do want you to take in the, there's a lot of different ways I can deal and prevent these pathogens or different types of bacterial diseases. Some of them are changing our hygiene, some of them are vaccination, etc. So let's summarize that. So how can I prevent and cure bacterial diseases? Well, preventing wise, the first step is I can have vaccines, just like vaccines for viruses, but they work a little bit differently. I'm going to Expose the body to a killed or weakened version of the bacteria. That's kind of the same as for the virus version. And the body's going to learn how to make antibodies or defenses against the real bacteria for that very reason. Um, I can also try to cure by having antibiotics, which is a chemical compound that will kill the bacteria or prevent them from reproducing. Oftentimes it breaks the bacteria's cell membrane. All right, but we've learned that we can accidentally misuse antibiotics as humans and oftentimes impact the bacterial colony or population to become resistant if there was a random mutation occurring in the population. Um, do know that this option, antibiotics, was not an option for viruses. Antibiotics are only for bacteria. Notice that antibiotics has the word bio in it, meaning a living thing. And was a virus a living thing? No, it sure was not. Okay, so antibiotics do not work for viruses. All right, examples of antibiotics are penicillin, ampicillin, and amoxicillin. Um, a lot of these we got from fungi, which is kind of cool. So how can we control bacterial growth if I'm getting nervous about bacteria growing and maybe making me sick? Well, I can use disinfectants, chemical solutions that kill the pathogen, like soap. Those aren't really antibiotics, but they do kill the pathogen. Again, remember the fact that we kill off bacteria depending on which types get left behind and are very strong. We sometimes worry about creating super bacteria or super bugs. So we got to really get them all if we're trying to kill them. To get them all, oftentimes humans will sterilize an area by heat. Um, we cook our food for this very reason. Oftentimes if we don't cook our food, we worry that we'll get food poisoning because there's a bacteria in there that would make us sick if we didn't kill it. 
Um, we can also refrigerate stuff. We do this all the time for our food. If we didn't put a lot of our food in the refrigerator after we make it, that could grow bacteria a lot more easily because low temperatures really slow the bacterial reproduction process. Wonderful job, guys. You made it.